Hey everybody, welcome to Fresh Take from What Fresh Hell Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. This is Amy, and today I'm talking to Sarah Peterson. Her essays about motherhood and feminism have appeared in the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, the Washington Post, and many other places. Sarah writes the newsletter In Pursuit of Clean Countertops, which I read every week, where she explores the cult of ideal motherhood. Sarah's new book is Momfluenced, Inside the Maddening, Picture-Perfect World of Mommy Influencer Culture. Sarah lives with her family in New Hampshire. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I want to say up front that before we get started talking about momfluencers, what they are and what they do, that this book is not making fun of independent content creators making content about motherhood, of which I am one, and people who make money doing that, of which I am one. Yep. You're not saying that it's bad to be one of those content creators and you don't sneer at the women who do those things. No, 100%. I was never interested in writing some sort of like takedown or, you know, reductive, this is good or this is bad, you know, perspective at any point. In the and, process. And the people like that, I mean, you make the point in the book that they're editors in chief of their own media companies. Some of them yeah. are extremely successful. Um, mm -hmm. And they are taking control of the narrative and defining motherhood as they see fit, which is powerful and wonderful and great. Yeah, totally. And then it starts to maybe get a little more complicated when they start to define motherhood for the rest of us. Is that where things start to go off track? Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of ways that things can go off track, many of which have nothing to do with individuals or their choices, most of which have to do with, I think, systems and our broader cultural understandings of what motherhood entails, what a quote unquote good mother should be and look like. Um, and yeah, when we chase those rabbit holes, we end up usually... <laughs> looking at patriarchy and looking at white supremacy, uh -huh. looking at capitalism. Uh -huh. um, so the bad guys in this book are not individuals in any way. It's usually a larger system created and upheld by usually white supremacist patriarchy. Society, right. Right. <laughs> so let's take a step back. How do you uh, define a momfluencer? Um, the simplest definition, I would say, is somebody who has utilized her maternal identity to monetize her social media platform. Um, but for the purposes of the book, I sort of broadened it to look at anybody who performs motherhood online, whether we have 100 followers or 100,000 followers, whether or not we're getting paid for our content creation or whether we're just sharing with, you know, IRL friends and family, because I do think consciously or unconsciously, we are all making choices about how we want to be perceived as mothers. Yeah, you say that in the book. In a way, we're all momfluencers. Every time we put a version of our lives that is not the whole story, because of course, it's never the whole story. Right. Therefore, we are all momfluencers. If totally. <laughs> social media. Right, right. And there's sort of two kinds, aren't there? There's the, I want to get into all the different kinds of momfluencers, but there's the like, don't you wish you lived in a field of poppies like I do? People, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And then there's the like, can you believe that my house looks like this kind of people? Yeah. Both of whom are valid and both of whom are yep. presenting versions of motherhood in which we see ourselves. But both of those are kind of stories, right? I mean, not the woman in the field of poppies isn't there all the time. Right. <laughs> right. Which is there sometimes. There was, right. There was an image in the, um, you wrote an article, I believe, for In Style, and there was an image of a woman bathing her. It looked like a Mary Cassatt painting of, of her, like, yeah. bathing her baby's feet with yeah. a pitcher, like a <laughs> yes. stone pitcher of water. Yep. And, the inter and then the, you interviewed the woman, and she's like, no, I, obviously I don't do that. That's not how I bathe my child. I just spend four right. hours making that picture for you. Right. And that's so interesting, right? That we, that why, why do you think we spend so much time consuming these, like, we know that's idealized. There's some large part of us that's like, that's not really how she does it. But I totally kind of think she does. Why is that? Yeah, I think our cultural understandings of motherhood, particularly in the U.S., are so baked in and so entrenched. I think often we don't even consider the fact that they were created. Like, our maternal ideals did not spring forth, you know, from the soil or whatever. They right. were created by people, usually for specific reasons. Um, but yeah, I think, I know I certainly grew up sort of idealizing the role of motherhood. Um, 
sort of viewing it as the be all end all of what I could do as a woman. Um, I definitely uncritically swallowed the notion that like I was born to be a mother Mm -hmm. and all of the skills that mothering entailed would just, they were naturally within me, naturally in air quotes. Um, Yeah. So I just think there's a lot of preconceived notions we have about mothers and motherhood that if we don't stop to sort of interrogate can get tricky. So what you talk about in the book is a sort of tension that what you're interested in, I think, is the intersection, the tension between what makes these content creators create these sort of utopias of motherhood or dystopias or whatever they are. Like, here's this world that you live in. Yeah. And our interest in getting like super over invested in what Jasper's wearing to kindergarten today, like we're, we're definitely meeting them halfway. Right. And, and, and why is that? Is it because our real lives don't, they fall short of these ideals? Yeah. I mean, you, you bring up the two opposite ends of the spectrum, like the beautific mother in the, you know, poppy field. Right. You know, there's no plastic in sight. She could be living in 1884 for all we know. Right. Or the, you know, hot mess express mom yeah. who's, you know, showing pictures of her, like, you know, cluttered pantry or whatever. And I think we do, I think as humans, we do gravitate towards binaries and simple narratives especially as mothers most of us live somewhere in a shade of gray like our lives are made up of shades of gray and shades of gray can be exhausting they can be challenging they can be frustrating and i think especially as mothers in the u.s largely unsupported you know by systems um largely left on our own to figure it out without meaningful support in any way. I think we do crave certainty. So maybe we go to the mom influencer in the poppy field because we know she's going to be in a poppy field. Like we know what we're getting. (laughs) And we go to the Hot Mess Express one for the same same reasons. Like we know exactly what we're going to get. There's no doubt. There's no like, ooh, what's it going to be? Because I think a lot of us are living in the, oh, how's today going to be? Oh, am I going to figure it out? You know, sort of space. Yeah. yeah. And then there's this sort of um, the cringe following or the, the hate <laughs> following. Right. So many of us do. I mean, allegedly cringe right. following. I don't actually believe that this woman's kitchen looks like that all the time. I, I right. hate follow this. But of course, then I'm like watching every video she puts out. What is that about? What motivates us to sort of pretend we don't care about this stuff that we care about? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think, one thing in researching the book is that sort of blew away my um, assumptions going in is that there is any, like, you know, there's not like 10 reasons we follow momfluencers. There are so many reasons that we follow momfluencers, Uh completely depending on our personal backgrounds, um, you know, our cultures. But I do think one reason we follow them is to sort of clarify our own maternal identities. So for example, if I am, you know, I talk about this in the book, if I'm following this trad wife, momfluencer, who waxes poetic about, you know, self, self-sacrificial self motherhood and living solely for her children and her husband, in a way I'm doing that to sort of firm up my own feminist beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like I can look at her and say, I'm not like that. I'm like this. Mm -hmm. And it sort of helps me clarify who I am by comparing myself to others, even if they're strangers online. That makes sense. Can you tell us a little bit more about trad wife for those who might not be familiar with that term? Yeah. So I guess it boils down to adhering to traditional gender norms. Um, so you could have a trad wife who lives on a self-sustaining a traditional farm. Wife, right? Yes, sure yes, traditional, right. traditional, yeah. short for traditional. So you could have a trad wife who lives on a farm. They grow, you know, completely self-sustaining. They never interact with modern society. Or you could have a trad wife who, you know, has all the trappings of modern life, but really prioritizes making her husband sandwiches when he gets home from work, and really prioritizes her domestic work over, you know work in the market sphere, for example. Um, But what unifies both of these examples is adherence to traditional norms. So the woman or the mother is at home taking care of the kids, taking care of the house, and the man is out in the market sphere making money. And, you know, he, she, she chooses to be led by him is 
one of the right right and they live in sort of a land i mean without i'm not going to name this particular influencer but there's one that has millions of followers whose husband is heir to a very large fortune but yeah. they live in the middle of nowhere on a farm with a bajillion kids and they milk the cows and they make the buttermilk and you know and you that's that part isn't visible it's sort of an open secret i guess yeah yeah, yeah i think it's so. like let's not talk about that part that you, this is gentleman farming or lady farming, right, i guess right. right you're kind of play acting this for us and we're implicit in creating all of that with them right when we when we consume the content yeah i i always find the comment threads really interesting like in like the account you were referencing yes because most of the comments are like glowing endorsements of this person's motherhood and her mm -hmm. maternal rightness and goodness. Like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you're such a good mother. How do you do it? You're such a good mom. You're such a good mom. You're such a good mom. None of us know what kind of mom this person is. Right. None of us have any clue, but we're so trained to see signposts of good motherhood as being, as checking like certain boxes. So she's white, she's cishet, she is married, she's thin, she adheres to Western beauty standards. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, she's got all this, therefore equals good mother. Mm. And that I think if we don't check it has, can have really harmful consequences. I think, I think we think that, you know, it's okay. Like, it's okay for us to just assume she's a good mom. Like, she probably is. Like, you know, why is that bad? But if we assume that only one type of mother is a good mom or, you know, like, should be praised for her motherhood, we are erasing and, yeah, we're erasing so many other types of mothers that don't adhere to all of those standards. That's such a good point. Okay, let's take a break. We're going to talk more about that when we come back. I'm talking to Sarah Peterson. She is the author of Momfluenced. So the idyllic past of idealized motherhood to me is the little golden books we used to get in the supermarket checkout line for 59 cents. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an old lady, but th that's <laughs> with the, the mom vacuuming and with her, with her kids all the time. That's mm -hmm. part of ideal motherhood, right? They're always with you and you're always so happy that they're with you <laughs> and they always cooperate while they're with you while you're doing the work of motherhood. Everybody's just so happy to be together. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, you make the point that that is, uh, an idyllic past that didn't exist literally for anybody, but particularly not for women who had to work two jobs who were single parents who were this, that that past didn't exist for, for anybody. And, and if, uh, for groups of women who are marginalized in some way, that experience is even more distant. And right. so when this sort of like, look at the beautiful dappled sunlight with which I bake my family's bread is presented as the ideal then that like pushes everybody else's experiences further to the side is that the harm that's being done yeah and yeah and i think it also has sort of a numbing effect like i think it tricks us into i mean i'm thinking of like maga hats like make right. america great again okay like make motherhood great again but like the concept of the nuclear family is so relatively new in terms of mm, human history yes for the vast majority of human history, we were living in community with extended family, with close friends and neighbors. We were raising children in community. That's how we've done it for the vast majority of human history. So this whole like idealizing and romanticizing the nuclear family that's completely self-sustaining and insular is really a toxic because most people are not happy like that like most people get burned out if the mother is solely responsible for you know keeping up a house and raising children like she is likely going to suffer burnout mm -hmm. and it's a new concept like it's mm -hmm. not it's not this thing that has you know it's just it's so new and it was only available it's only available still to very few people and you make the point that during the pandemic, these sort of, you know, fields of sunflowers sort of accounts, they were very escapist. Like the pandemic didn't exist in, right. in those worlds. And right. in some ways, like that was great. We were all looking for little worlds in which the pandemic didn't exist when we were yep. all stuck at home with sick people and kids who had to be educated and everything else. Yeah. But it also, there also was some part of me, I suppose, that was looking at those accounts like, oh, I want to live in that world, but there's no pandemic and, and it's real and it exists and I must be doing something wrong that I'm not there loving it like they are. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, 
I was, I would follow some of those accounts during the pandemic. And while sometimes I would get escapist pleasure, like, oh, she's milking a cow. That's like, it's fun to just focus on, you know, it's just fun to focus right. on. And I like, guess you a don't cow. need a mask while you're milking a cow in the middle right. of nowhere. You probably right. don't need that. Good for you. Right. But when, but I would also get really mad because most of us, most of the mothers during the pandemic were really not doing well. Most of mm -hmm. us were, suff I mean, most of us were having a tough time. Mm -hmm. Some of us were having a really, really, really tough time. And some mm -hmm. of us were having like a marginally less tough time, but none of us were doing great. Right. So there was something really off-putting about a decontextualized version of motherhood that didn't exist within the constraints of the pandemic. Um, and especially when some of those accounts would like, you know, have parties without masks, you know, pre-vaccine. Yeah. It was it was upsetting. And you have to have a lot of privilege to pretend that current events don't exist. You have to have a ton of privilege to not be impacted by current events. Yeah. And yeah, so I was never able to fully tap into like a hundred percent escapist pleasure. For me it was messier. <laughs> yeah. And what about you make a really good point in the book that there's also harm to the creators sometimes i mean they're, they're yeah. buying into this and then they're on the hamster wheel and i've got to yeah. make four videos by tomorrow and it's you know it's a stressful way to make a living yeah and then there's this also so there's one group of mom influencers that sort of perform perfect all the time yeah. and then there's another group that sort of performs gritty and sometimes one becomes the other right the wheels <laughs> come off and yeah. they do that in public right like i'm, I'm getting a divorce and i'm going to talk about it because i talk about everything mm -hmm. and then they have to sort of keep performing that you call it performing sad mom drag i'm like wow right. yeah I, I understand what you mean <laughs> yeah and what happens then yeah i mean almost every mom influencer i spoke to for the book referenced struggling to maintain that line between public and private identity mm -hmm. um and it gets even more complicated i think if we're talking about like a mom influencer versus like a style influencer because I think most moms agree that motherhood does feel, or it can feel, not for everyone, it can feel like a bit of self erasure at first. Like you've lived your whole adult life, you know, trying to attain X, Y, and Z goals, trying to find yourself, trying to like self actualize. And then you have a child, and all of a sudden yourself blurs with that new baby, and you become sort of dislocated. And so the mom influencers, they're performing just their maternal identities often, when in fact, like we all have so many identities within us. And I think it can be confounding for mom influencers to, if they're, if they're earning money solely based on their maternal identities, I think, I just think that gets psychologically really tricky. And they're also at the mercy of the algorithm and all these social media companies. Right which, you know, they're changing what, you know, one day reels will get the most engagement the next. So, you know, the social, so the, so the mom influencer will get her whole strategy, you know, completely focused on reels and yes. then they'll change it. And it'll yep. be like, no, you need two stories and then a picture or <laughs> whatever. And so, and, and I spoke to many who also said like, yeah, I can't take breaks because the algorithm will not be happy. Right. 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 And I won't get as many eyeballs. And, it does, I do want to sort of push back on this idea that becoming a mom influencer can allow you to have that much sat, sought after balance because, mm. you know, right. yes, you can theoretically stay home with your kids, but you're also working all the time. Right. So yeah, like mom influencers need childcare too. They are working constantly. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't love the whole, you know, they've figured out this work-life balance idea. Right. Because right. I don't think they have. And the work yeah. is the home and they also have to do the home stuff, but it can't be visible in the shot. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a lot. All right. We're take we're talking to Sarah Peterson, the author of Momfluenced. I want to talk about the financial spendy part of momfluencing and how it affects us all when we get back. So, Sarah. You talk in the book about how mom influencers are basically today's magazine ads. You know, that the, my mom or even me would read magazines and see pictures of somebody living a life that looked wonderful to me that yeah. um, that I'd be like, oh, I wish I could be like that person. But you 
the funniest example of the J. Crew catalog and the girl <laughs> in the roll neck sweater. Like you yes. want to be her, but you right. don't know her name or where she met her boyfriend. Totally. You know, it's a whole other level. So explain how that takes it to a whole other level. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was an avid reader of J. Crew catalogs. Right. Definitely wanted to be them. <laughs> yeah, whoever they totally. were, what they were doing. Totally. But I didn't have their whole story living in my subconscious yep, the way yep. I do with some of the mom influencers I've been following for several years. And yes, I intellectually understand that social media, you know, involves a certain layer of performance. I understand that on an intellectual level. But if you consume somebody's life for, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, they are living inside you in a way that the J. Crew model never can, regardless of whether or not we understand that it's performance and that it's just one slice, you know, it's one little snapshot, it's not, you know, the whole picture. We still we still can hold ourselves up against these people these strangers and we can form these parasocial bonds with them yes. even if we think we're you know you know i'm above that or i'm smarter than that it, yes. it kind of happens without <laughs> your permission in a way and it happens without the creator realizing you give an example in the book of a creator being horrified when somebody came up to her nanny and her kids in the park and said like oh i know these kids i don't even know the kids names like this is parker and this is emma and oh my gosh and i and i know them and the nanny was like, this person acted like she knew you. And this content creator was horrified by that. But right. I, in that, I kind of read like, well, what did you what did you think when you were putting your kids on the internet every day? And this, yes, you do kind of forget that the person has developed this parasocial relationship with you, but they have. Right, right. But it is a one-sided relationship. Yes. And that can be so, it's, it's just such a confusing modern <laughs> dilemma that right. we're in and we're all like this is such a new phase also this technology is so new like i do really wonder you know what we will have learned 200 300 years from now about the impact of social parasocial relationships um explain I won that a little more I yeah think you might have glossed over that a little bit sure. what is a parasocial relationship so it's essentially um forming a bond that you typically have with people in your actual life, your friends, your neighbors, your community members, and feeling similar feelings to somebody you have never met, um, usually online, despite the fact that they don't know you exist. Right. And yeah. And, and again, the better the storyteller is, the more you're going to develop the sense that you kind of sort of know them, even though you don't and you probably never will. And is that a bad thing? Like I'm thinking about podcast, people who listen to this podcast, yeah. the podcast that I listen to, I definitely have that invested relationship in the people who are in my ears all the time. Same. And I guess that's okay as long as they're making you feel better about yourself instead of worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. It, it's definitely not a good, bad thing. Okay. It's just, uh, I think it's like the type of thing that you have to constantly be checking in with yourself about. Mm. Like am i am i having nightmares about this person like <laughs> or am i like finding myself feeling badly about my parenting choices because i'm compare comparing them to the parenting choices i think this complete stranger is making right so yeah i think you kind of have to check in with yourself see how much space they're taking up <laughs> and yeah. whether or not that energy you're investing is feeding you or depleting you. And of course, you can't forget that that the depth of that relationship that you feel is then being used to sell you stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if it's a monetized account, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And I, and it's not like I think and I really don't it's even I don't know, I guess that's tricky because it's like they can be as honest and as authentic as they're capable of being and also want to make a living from posting sure. an ad for like Absolutely. toothpaste. Like this yeah, like, has ads. Like it's okay right. to make a living. Right. Yes. Like one doesn't cancel out the other. It's not right. like because I a mom influencer makes ads, she's incapable of person. being honest. Right. And right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. But it's that it's more just the awareness of like their presence is also selling us something. It's getting us to yeah. stay on Instagram. Instagram is right. trying to sell us to stay on Instagram, right? Yes. And so, and so when we're consuming content, we're still on Instagram. Right. 
And then I suppose, you know, at Yellow Sunshine Mama, she <laughs> might not be making money from the reel that you're going to see next. Right. But Instagram is. Yeah. And, and this is where being sold, you know, you're being sold something. Yeah. And this is where I think it's also really challenging for the creators because like they can have the purest intentions, but if they look at their metrics and see that like, oh, when I opened up about like, you know, my marriage difficulties last week, yeah, I saw yeah. a huge rise in engagement. Like they're not bad for the next time they come up against like a life hurdle. They're not bad for thinking to themselves like, well, I mean, I'm going through this really difficult time, but I might as well share about it because at least then I'll be going through a difficult time and maybe <laughs> like gaining followers so I can get better sponsorship deals and make more money. Like it's yeah. such, the cycle is so fraught. Yeah. And you're forced sometimes, I'm thinking of one influencer who I saw who um, was going through a, a divorce, apparently. And I, I felt like I had to stop watching because it was a video in which like, we've been broken up for 12 hours. It's fine. We're better than ever. The kids are going to be fine. It's like, you, you, you don't know this yet. And I know you feel the pressure to be performing this for us, but yeah, you could, you should just log off yeah. now. Right. Uh, but you, but you're invested and you wonder like, oh, now right. what's going to happen? What is she going to say tomorrow? And so then we participate in it. I know. I know. I know. So what do we do about this? Do you think it's something we need to like check in ourselves? Do we log off? Do you put limits on it? How, how did your perception of what is good or bad about this change when you wrote this book? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's so, so individual. Um, for me, I can only share my, you know, own experience and I'm just one person, <laughs> but I am pretty shocked by the difference in my well-being when I take like real social media breaks. Like when I completely log off for a week, for example, I am I feel markedly better, <laughs> like in almost every way. Um, I don't find myself missing anything that I might be finding on social media. Mm. You know, there's the argument like maybe you're missing out on news topics or I don't know, like zeitgeisty conversations. Sure. But you're also gaining, like, at least for me, I gain such a sense of quiet when I log off of social media, just because there are less, even though these people are not people I actually know, and even though I'll probably never meet them in real life, there's less characters coming at me <laughs> with, yeah. you know, like in my life and in my, yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, I do dream about influencers I follow. They, they're in there. So... Yeah, I guess my general advice would be to, yeah, check in with yourself. And, you know, I tell a story in the book about a woman who I interviewed a psychiatrist and she was telling me about one of her patients who took her kids to a blueberry patch. And, you know, one of her kids was going through like behavioral challenges at the time. And so the therapist was like, so why did you go to the blueberry patch? Like, do, do you love blueberry picking? Like, is this something that's like always been a part of your life? And she was like, no. And she's like, so then why did you go? And she was like, I mean, everybody's posting blueberry patch pictures on Instagram. <laughs> like, that's just what you do if you're a good mom. And I I love that story because I think we've all been there. I think we've yes. all just felt this pressure to check whatever box based on what we're consuming via social, me via social media. And it's, yeah, it's really hard to stop and say, like, is this important to my internal values? Or do I just want a cute picture to feel as though I am a good mom or to get external validation for my good mom? Yes, motherhood? we call that like pumpkin town parenting on this podcast. Oh my podcast. gosh, yes. And that's what it is. Like, do I want to be a pumpkin town? Do my kids want to be a pumpkin town? Does anybody here think it's fun? Or are we just like <laughs> right. the flannel shirts and we're going to sit on the darn pumpkins <laughs> yes. because I have to? Yeah. Or the Christmas cards or whatever that we're mm -hmm. performing or like well, everybody else is doing it. So, so we have to. Yeah. Well, I wanted to close with a little bit of talking about like what is, what are the positives of the sort of momfluencer culture? Because I've gotten a lot of good out of the some of the Same. accounts that I follow, Same. and and one of the um, the things that you highlight is is the idea that it, it can help us find meaning and beauty in motherhood and help us remember sort of better days. Yeah, when we're not having those days. Yeah, and sort of remind us of of why we wanted to do this in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I mean. It's also an incredible equalizer in terms of democratizing whose voice is heard. Um, 
I interviewed Mia O'Malley, who's a momfluencer, and she's created a network of healthcare providers who, you know, are not fat phobic and are not bringing their anti-fat bias to their practice. And that's a huge issue mm. for uh, fat moms in particular being denied care. Um, and so, yeah, so she's created this network of these providers that people can reach out to knowing they're going to have a positive healthcare uh, experience. And this is like really huge for, say, somebody in a small town who has limited resources in terms of like geographic access. She can just go on Instagram and click on a link and, you know, have like a wealth of information at her fingertips. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I think social media's power to do good, like, can't be ignored because, yeah, it definitely unifies communities, creates communities. Um, yeah, especially yeah, especially when it comes to motherhood. Like there are so many specific things that happen in terms of, you know, one's mothering experience that often your friends won't have experienced or your family members will not have experienced. And it can be really, really life giving to find somebody online, even if that person, you know, is a relative stranger, and sort of swap stories and experiences and feel less alone. So I yeah, I think that is really huge and important. We've been talking to Sarah Peterson, who brand new book is Momfluenced Inside the Maddening Picture Perfect World of Mommy Influencer Culture. Sarah, tell us about your newsletter and everything that you do and everywhere our listeners can find more about you. Yeah. Um, so my newsletter is called In Pursuit of Clean Countertops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just because that's like my own, I don't know, Achilles heel in terms of <laughs> adhering to maternal perfection. Um, but yeah, it's about momfluencer culture and it's it interrogates the cult of ideal motherhood. Um, and my book, Momfluenced, of course, and you can follow me and you can buy the book wherever books are sold. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at S. Louise Peterson. I will put the link to that, to the book, and to subscribe to the newsletter all in the show notes for this episode. Sarah, thanks for talking to me today. Thank you so much.